Good afternoon and welcome back to the 2019 um, AWS Public Sector Summit. My name is Courtney, I'll be your room host this afternoon. Um, and we are here in the GovCloud track, um, getting ready to start the taking a dip in the Mooney Bond data lake. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, please note the emergency exit signs above the doors in, the back, in both the back and there's some behind the stage in case of an emergency. Bathrooms are located um, outside in the main hall. Uh, if you take a left, they're down the hall just a couple steps. Um, and please make sure all of your devices are silenced at this time. Um, all sessions will be recorded and able um, for your, sent out for your viewing um, in the next couple of weeks following the summit. Um, and with that, we will we'll kick off the session this, session this afternoon. Thank you and welcome. My name is Mark Kim. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer for the MSRB, which stands for the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. I'm guessing that a lot of you aren't that familiar with the MSRB, and maybe even for some of you, this is the first time you ever heard of the MSRB. And so my only concern is, did you guys wander into the wrong salon to hear <laughs> this presentation? But don't leave. Uh, you should stay because I'm very confident that we share a very similar trait, and that is the importance of data to our organizations um, and our love-hate relationship with data. So raise your hand if you work at an organization where data is important to both your professional success as well as the success of your organization. Practically every single hand is up in the air. <laughs> I'm not sure where the others work, but um, <laughs> is any of that data unstructured by any chance? So to unlock the information that's in that data that you need to do your job, does it rely on manual processes that are high touch, might be expensive, um, there's data quality issues, validation issues, with this unstructured data. Does that start to sound familiar to you? Because that's the problem and the challenge that we faced at the MSRB. And that's the problem that we were solving for. And how we solved for that was we partnered with Hitachi and AWS to design and build a data analytics platform as well as a search portal that we're gonna describe to you today. And we did that by leveraging AWS tools and manage services. Um, that's our story, and that's what we want to share with you today. As we walk through this agenda, I hope that you'll um, leave the presentation with three takeaways. The first is, who's the MSRB, and what do we do? <laughs> um, the second is, why did we partner with Hitachi and AWS? And the third, and perhaps the most important, is I hope you'll leave with some insights gained from our approach to the solution that will enable you to go back to your organizations um, and help you to think about and solve some of the data challenges that, that you face in your organizations. So those are the three goals that we have for today. So let me start with who we are and what do we do. Um, the MSRB was created by Congress in 1975 to protect investors in the municipal securities industry, the market. So um, the investors that buy municipal bonds, how do we protect them? We do it primarily in two ways. We write the rules that regulate this industry, and we also promote market transparency largely through information systems and data. So you're gonna hear data as a consistent theme um, throughout the presentation today. We are a self-regulatory organization, which means that we're independent of the federal government, although we're subject to oversight by the SEC. We are self-funded, so we receive no federal appropriations, so if federal government is shut down because of a budget impasse, our doors are still open and we're still serving the market. Um, the most important thing for today's presentation that I want you to take away from uh, about the MSRB and what we do is that we are the official sole repository of information for this industry. So what that means is 
we have a regulatory monopoly on data. Have I got your attention now? <laughs> Good. So let me pivot from the MSRB to the industry that we regulate. It has 3.9 trillion market capitalization. There's over a million municipal bonds outstanding. On any given day, there's 40,000 trades that are executed, totaling $11 billion in municipal bonds that are trading hands. Who's issuing all these municipal bonds? We have over 50,000 state and local governments that issue municipal bonds in the US. Why do they issue these municipal bonds? To finance two-thirds of the infrastructure in this country. And in fact, you're sitting in a convention center that was built by a municipal bond or financed by a municipal bond. You can't go a day in your life in the United States without depending on something that a municipal bond financed. It's really remarkable if you think about it. If you went to public schools when you were a child, that school was built by a municipal bond. If you took the subway in to get to the convention center, guess how they financed the purchase of that subway with the municipal bond? If you walk on the streets, if you drink the water, they were all financed with municipal bonds. Um, this is a critical industry that builds the infrastructure of this country. And state and local governments issue about $440 billion of municipal bonds each year to uh, build that infrastructure. So what does all of this mean? It means that the MSRB has a lot of data. There's three types of data in particular that we have. Primary market data, so every time one of those state or local governments decides to issue a municipal bond to finance infrastructure, they have to file what's called an official statement with the MSRB because we're the official repository. We are the single source of truth of municipal bonds. It's very similar to when an Uber or a Lyft files their registration statement with the SEC to go public they are required to file that, and the SEC is the official repository of that information. We are the official repository when muni bonds IPO. The second type of data we have is secondary market. So after the bonds are issued, they trade back and forth 40,000 times a day, $11 billion are trading hands. Every single time one of those bonds is bought, sold, or traded, it has to be reported back to the MSRB within 15 minutes of the execution of that trade through one of our market information systems. We take that information, turn it right back around and put it back to the market so we can give the market real-time live information on the, on the price and the value of those bonds. That's how we promote market transparency, market efficiency. These municipal bonds stick around for a long time. State and local governments issue infrastructure lasts a long time so do the municipal bonds that they finance, sometimes 30 years, sometimes even longer. So there's continuing disclosure that has to happen throughout the life of that bond. Anytime something that's of material interest to an investor that happens, maybe uh, something positive like the state or the local government might get a credit rating upgrade, so the value of that bond that they're holding might go up if they get upgraded, that material event needs to be reported to the MSRB within 10 business days so that we can then take that information, turn it back around and put it out to the market. So we have a lot of data. So what do we do with it? We're gonna move it to the cloud. Um, our board made a very big decision uh, this past spring for the MSRB to do an enterprise scale migration to AWS's public cloud. And all of our data will be in the cloud. Why did the MSRB decide to migrate to the cloud, and in particular to AWS? Really a number of reasons. Um, data being front and center amongst them, it was to uh, really unlock the value of the data that we have. It was potentially to develop new products and services that will benefit the investors in this market. It was to um, digitize and automate everything, or everything we could. Really, what it boils down to is our board 
made a strategic decision that technology is important to the future of this organization, and the cloud was a way to enable um, us to uh, capitalize on that. So let me turn the conversation over to my colleague, Carl, who's going to talk a little bit about the business opportunity that we saw with our data. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you uh, for coming to our session. Um, why is so much information collected about financial products? I think the answer to that is you're going to collect it an amount of information about something is proportional to the amount of money you're putting into it. You're going to research a car or a house a lot more than you're going to research a toaster, right? So a municipal security investment is often as much as a house or a car in terms of money. So people really want to have access to the information about those bonds. And if you're researching municipal bonds, as I think you picked up from Mark's comment, eventually you're going to end up on the MSRB's EMMA website, which is the public, free public website we make available for investors and market professionals who serve them to come and access all of this data. Now, uh, I think Mark covered a lot of the information on this screen. Uh, I, I do want to just highlight the sheer volume and depth and breadth of information that we are collecting uh, by just uh, talking about a couple of issuers you may not think of as issuers of municipal bonds. Maybe you've are aware, for example, that the Washington Airports Authority issued bonds so they could build a train out to Dulles Airport, the new metro line. That's municipal bonds. Uh, my high school, actually, this uh, spring issued bonds. And uh, it's possible your alma mater has issued municipal bonds for some purpose. And there's a couple more I, I thought were funny that came to market last week. I thought I would read you the names of these issuers who are in the bond market. There's the Little Lake Fire Protection District in Mendocino, California. And there's Sanitary Improvement District number 261 of Sarpy County, Nebraska. Both came to market in the last two weeks. So a really, really diverse and broad set of issuers, which is why we've already collected over 4,000 official statements this year and over 60,000 continuing disclosure documents. And searching through all of that on our EMMA website is going to be very important, and we take that very seriously. So we chose as our target to kind of see if we could take search and information extraction to a deeper level, uh, the official statement documents. Uh, what you see on the screen there, those three pages are actually from the official statement where the city of Washington decided it needed a new convention center and uh, issued a $524 million bond to build the building that you're going to be walking around in today. So I think it was a great decision. I think it was a fantastic space. So why is, why is this document so compelling? Well, remember, the Washington Convention Center Authority is borrowing money. So one way to think about this is, uh, think if you ever got a mortgage, think about the giant stack of documents you had to prepare before you got the mortgage that showed how much other debts or um, assets you had, what your income was. All of that's going to be in this document. And then there's the stack of papers you signed at closing, what your interest rate's going to be, what happens if you prepay, if you don't pay. Um, and how often do you pay? Uh, all of that is also contained in this document. Think of all those documents being compiled into one 350-page document, which has all of that information related to this security. So it's really a deep and comprehensive set of data buried inside this document. I do want to point out, if you look at this, there's some information is in headers there. <laughs> On the second page, you can see there's a table, an obscured part of it. but and then on the third page, there's just paragraphs and paragraphs of information written in full plain text. So um, there's no uh, structure to how that data is organized. So um, if you take off your investor hat for a minute, um, I'm going to uh, have you imagine that your IT folks or project folks, should be a, a big leap of faith there and recruit you to my team. And so on the first day of the project, I like to give an inspirational speech. So here's my inspirational speech. We're sitting on a treasure trove of data. It's the official, the final word on each bond that's in the market. And, and we, if we think we can unlock that data, we're going to make the market more transparent and we'll make the investors more knowledgeable. And if we make the investors more knowledgeable and the market more transparent, we're doing a good job protecting investors 
and making sure that they can come to this place. So that's our mission. What's stopping us? The first thing is, as we mentioned, everything's in PDFs. And you saw tables, headers, just text and paragraphs. It's all in there. Very complicated. The second thing is uh, there are no uniform standards. No one is setting standards for these documents. If you're a sanitary district outside of Omaha or a school district outside of Syracuse, uh, no one's telling you how to structure these things. And last, uh, <laughs> we're, we're running a full development schedule on the EMMA system all the time, obviously. And right now our IT operations team, who are represented here actually, uh, are juggling our environments constantly to support a very active development team. So when you come onto our project and welcome to the team, you don't get any servers. So you'll have to do without that. Um, so with that, welcome to the team. And I want to turn it over to Hannah, who can talk Thank about you. the tools that we could bring to the job. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Um, so my name is Hannah Marlow. I'm actually, uh, I work at AWS. I am a consultant with Amazon uh, Web Services Professional Services team. Uh, there, I specialize in assisting customers implement uh, big data, analytics, and machine learning solutions in AWS. Uh, and our role as professional services is to actually come in and work very closely with customers um, in kind of a hands-on keyboard way to implement those solutions in the cloud. So today, I really just want to talk through um, and give some background uh, to some of the services that the MSRB team use to build out their solutions. Um, and then I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to let their partner um, talk through the actual deep dive of, of their particular architecture. Um, but what they, what they built out here was uh, a natural language processing powered uh, search engine for this data. Uh, so starting with the use case of, hey, we have a lot of very valuable, this golden data, this treasure trove of data, but it's not structured, it's not indexed. Um, if you wanted to search through it, you probably have to do very, very targeted kind of searches through it. Um, and if you don't, you know, if you're, if you're looking to discover new things or, or you're looking for smart um, analytics, no. How's that? <coughs> Better? No? <coughs> How about now? Is that loud enough? No? I could yell. I could yell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? I can just, I'll project a little bit more. Um, this is, oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, okay. Um, right, so you have this treasure trove of data um, and you wanna be able to get smart uh, search results back from it, um, leveraging machine learning tools. So um, the team, in order to accomplish this, uh, they turned to Amazon Comprehend uh, for natural language processing. And Amazon Comprehend is a great service for this. Um, so instead of, uh, you know, a lot of times when, when people come in and they say, okay, we wanna impl implement machine learning solutions, they say, okay, we've gotta get training data, we've gotta build a new model from scratch, uh, we have to figure out how to deploy and host that model. Whereas um, Amazon Comprehend is a fully managed machine learning uh, service where um, it's really meant for you to be able to pull an already optimized, ready to go uh, model. Uh, your developers can use it without having to have any machine learning background. It's already been trained on a, on a huge uh, amount of data. And you can just call the service using simple API calls. So it's a, it's a great way to build uh, machine learning into your applications to make them smarter. And particularly Amazon Comprehend uh, is a natural language processing service. So it uses machine learning in order to find insights and relationships in unstructured text data. Uh, so Amazon Comprehend can be used to identify, um, in, your, in your unstructured text data, it can identify things like uh, key phrases and entities such as uh, people, uh, places, uh, locations, dates uh, in your text. Um, it, it can understand the language of your text, uh, as well as understand how positive or negative that text is with sentiment analysis. So a great use case there if you have, you know, for instance, uh, social media comments or, or product reviews, you could uh, use Amazon Comprehend to automatically tell you, are these reviews looking positive, are they negative, do you need to flag some uh, here or there? 
Um, it also can identify topics of, of documents, so it can help you index and, and sort your uh, documents by topic. So for a use case like MSRB, where you have this uh, you know, treasure trove of unstructured text data, you can start to leverage Comprehend to index that data, to identify where, um, where key entities are throughout the text to uh, sort that text by topic. Um, and then when you think about building out your search engine capabilities, now you can make your search engine, your, your search results uh, smarter and you can leverage those uh, entities. So now what, rather than having to do really targeted searches you know, to, to find specific people of interest, you can start to, to identify just where people are throughout your text, uh, get smarter suggestions back without needing that really targeted input going in. So, um, you know, at this point you need a way to search through this large amount of text data. Uh, and that's where the team turned to Amazon Elastic Search Service. Amazon Elastic Search Service um, is basically a fully managed implementation of Elastic Search. Uh, Elastic Search is open source software. It's a search engine that's built on the Apache Lucene library. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Elastic Search, um, it is a, it's a, it's probably best known for and kind of grew up around log analytics. Um, and so, you know, if you think about all the devices in your life that generate logs and needing a way to monitor applications, monitor devices, um, that's really where, where, it, uh, where it grew up and um, where it kind of came to fame. It is, however, a very versatile service. So besides uh, log analytics, monitoring business intelligence, dashboarding with Kibana, um, it's great for IoT and mobile implementations, so thinking about integrating with uh, real-time location-aware monitoring for device fleets, uh, as well as the use case which uh, is most pertinent to MSRB, which is full-text search capabilities and analytics. Uh, so as I said, uh, Elasticsearch is an open source tool. Uh, there's lots of ways to deploy Elasticsearch, uh, and you can certainly deploy it on your own with EC2 in, in AWS. Uh, whereas Amazon Elasticsearch Service is a fully managed implementation of Elasticsearch. Uh, so the idea here is really just to simplify a lot of the time-consuming tasks that, um, that can go along with, uh, with deploying and managing and scaling Elasticsearch clusters. So it takes away a lot of the overhead of hardware provisioning, software installations, patching, failure recovery. It's very easy to get started and use, which um, I think worked out very well for this uh, POC, especially uh, they, the team was able to, rather than focusing on all these tasks, um, get up and running a little bit faster. Uh, so it's, uh, you can manage it via uh, API calls, and the SDK, uh, uh, Amazon CLI, or just clicks in the console. Um, and you can deploy with uh, cloud formation as well. Um, it's also, it's a drop-in replacement for Elasticsearch, so you don't need to learn any new APIs or skills in order to uh, use your Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, you can deploy your clusters into your, your own VPC and you can restrict access using security groups and IAM policies. Um, and we also take a lot of the hassle out of deploying a highly available system, so we can uh, deploy your Elasticsearch cluster across uh, multiple AVs, two or three AVs as well, if you want uh, dedicated main nodes on, on each uh, availability zone. Uh, and it's really tightly integrated with other AWS services. So on the ingest side, it's very, very easy, for instance, to send CloudWatch logs uh, to Elasticsearch. Uh, you can also use uh, Logstash, and uh, you can have uh, Kinesis Firehose delivery scheme delivered directly to your Elasticsearch cluster. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back off to uh, Santosh with Hitachi Venturi to talk about yep. a deep dive on their architecture for the solution. Thank you, Hannah. Can you hear me? All right, thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Santosh Karla. I'm uh, from a principal architect with Hitachi Ventara, and uh, today we'll talk about the real under the hood, uh, and thanks for setting the context, so I hope most of you now have a little bit of context about MSRB, the problem that we're trying to solve, and then how we got them there. So just to give a little bit brief of who we are. So we are Hitachi Ventara. We are previously known as Rain Cloud. 
Uh, we are a born in the cloud company, a startup which started in 2013, and we were recently acquired by Hitachi Vantara in 2018. And uh, we are one of the premier consulting partners of Amazon. So Hitachi's acquisition of RainCloud enables um, us to accelerate our footprint into hybrid cloud uh, solutions for our customers because of our cloud experience and the on-prem expertise that Hitachi and the solutions that Hitachi brings to the table. So moving on to the solution. So as uh, Mark said the context, so there's a lot of unstructured data. And when we first met Mark, so we asked him, what are your goals? So in addition to just doing a POC, and uh, we ended up doing two POCs, and that's what we're going to talk about. This is uh, two prototypes, very rapid prototypes. So we asked, like, what exactly is your goal? What are you trying to achieve other than um, uh, ingesting and exploring some cloud capability? So the first thing was we want to be able to eliminate the manual processes, take this unstructured data. We have a lot of uh, treasure trove of data, as everybody uh, mentioned. So there's so much data that they would like to take it, process it, and see what insights we can get out of that data, right? So that was the first goal. Number two was we want to build for the future, so not just build something right now, but we should be able to quickly accelerate, pivot, and then build for the future, right? And then number three, we also wanted to explore cloud and what does it bring to the table, uh, and then make a decision. As uh, Mark mentioned, as of uh, this early this year, they made a decision to go to the cloud. So the combination of all these goals in order to achieve, which is the four blocks that you're seeing here, as uh, built on as part of two prototypes. So the first three blocks that you're seeing, which is a very powerful serverless secure data analytics platform, leveraging AWS native uh, services powered by our platform capabilities. And then we have leveraged um, Elasticsearch and natural language processing using Comprehend to be able to identify and extract entities and data points, which will show you how we leverage that in the uh, use case. And the third one is the knowledge graph. And this is really uh, meant for the build for the future. And uh, I'll talk about it in the next slide. And when we started off with this first prototype, we didn't have the second prototype in mind at all. But when we looked at the results of the first prototype, which we could just do it in like six weeks, they were somewhat promising, uh, and some, some of them were not really promising. But we learned what we uh, wanted to learn out of that experience. And in order to improvise that, we felt maybe it's not going to, it's, it's time consuming and also it's expensive. So we pivoted and said, how about we leverage a build a solution that is a very powerful search portal that you can search across this entire treasure trove of unstructured documents. So we start out, uh, started out with building a secure data lake uh, solution in the cloud, which is powered by Amazon S3, which is the simple storage service. And, uh, what you're seeing here is the foundation of the data uh, lake, where you have these raw buckets, you have the curated buckets and the published buckets. Ideally, each one has its own um, uh, area, uh, own importance. Raw is where you hold all the unstructured data without doing any modifications. It could be structured, it could be semi-structured, and all that. Curated is where you now have transformed that, taken it out, from the raw, and then uh, you're now building into a more machine-readable format, and publish is what you want to really visualize, provide, your, uh, provide some insights to your users, your business users, or technical users, or what have you. Now, we started ingesting these documents, and as you can see on the top left, so the first exercise that we had to do was extract some data elements out of this unstructured document. So if you all remember, and if you, uh, the glimpse of the PDF that Carl has showed you, you could see each of those documents which are coming from all these different entities are totally different. There is no standard format. So you can see that 
there is, it's not a template. Like for example, if you look at, if you all are familiar with the mortgage loans or like your passport applications or whatever, each one is a template. So you exactly know where the fields are. Maybe there are different versions, but these documents, everybody who is uh, issuing these bonds, each one has a different format. So re you really don't know where to anchor upon, where to extract them. So the first exercise was, hey, can we extract who the issuer is? Can we extract who the, uh, the table that you saw and all the elements of the, out of the table? And can we also extract when is the maturity date, when is the closing date, and some of these elements out of that, right? So that's the first step. And then in the lambda that you're seeing here, um, what basically that lambda is performing is what we call as, as a document validation. And we are making sure that we are processing the actual file that it is supposed to be processed. And also we are make, ensuring that it is the most latest version. So there are like several revisions of the official statement documents that you receive. So that's the first step it actually is doing there. Then once it passes the uh, document validation step, it moves on and then if we leverage AWS step functions, which is a, a, work, a workflow and a state machine uh, so a solution from Amazon. And in that step function, there are like seven steps that are happening. Although we uh, represented Amazon Comprehend, which is the most important uh, service that's happening. So basically we take the 350 page document that you have seen, break it apart into single pages. We store that single pages and then tell you why we store, do that. Then we start extracting the content into a, a more human readable uh, format using Apache Tika. At that point, unfortunately, we didn't have Amazon Tesseract, which we now have, and it's general available, so we'll probably explore that later. But we were running Apache Tika on a Lambda to extract the data. And then we also have Amazon Comprehend to extract the natural language entities. Like, as I mentioned, some of the key parameters was like, hey, can I pull the amounts? Can I pull the dates? So and a Comprehend is a powerful tool which helps us to quickly send that uh, extracted text as a blob of text to Comprehend, and it's going to give us all the entities. Then we also leveraged, uh, for the tabular data, we leveraged uh, uh, Tabula, which is another open source technology to, you can extract just the tablet uh, information out of that. So all this extracted data now goes into two parts, which is one where it's a curated bucket. So we store all that and we leverage that curated bucket, uh, uh, information stored in the curated bucket at a later time. And then it also goes into Elasticsearch. So this is where once we have extracted the text that gets indexed into Elasticsearch and it is now ready to be so, uh, searchable, all the content that you have. Now, as soon as uh, we are done with the extraction process, we move on to the validation. So what exactly is the validation, right? So when you saw the PDFs, there is also another artifact that is uploaded by all these providers. It's a XML-based uh, file, but that's a human-entered data. The source of truth for MSRB lies in the official statement document. So somebody is looking at the official statement and they're entering some data into that. So both of them come as a feed into a MSRB, and then there is a manual process that uh, the MSRB users do. So our first prototype was to see, hey, can we eliminate that manual process? So we had to extract all these data elements, So now, which we did as part of the first step. And now as part of the second step, we are taking the data from the XML and now comparing to see, did we match this? How accurately did we match the data? And then all that data goes into a knowledge graph, which will help us to build the, for the future, which I'll talk about very shortly. And also uh, the data goes into Elasticsearch. So in addition to that, you also see uh, there uh, we have enabled MSRB to start searching uh, their documents, their content, and also all these dashboards that we're talking about, the extraction, the validation. So in order for them to view, we built Kibana dashboards. So the data was ingested into Kibana, the comparison data was ingested into Kibana, and then there were dashboards that were serving out of Kibana for us to use. And then they could, from Kibana dashboards, they could also click on the documents, go to the XML, go to the PDF, and also look at the accuracy metrics for each of that. So in addition to that, there was also, uh, we pro enabled them to do ad hoc queries using Amazon Athena on your curated and the published data. Now, as I mentioned, so we did two prototypes. And this is what 
we finished as prototype one, and I'll talk about the results in the next slide. And then when we looked at those results, as I said, it was there are a lot of opportunities for us to refine, improve upon the, uh, upon the accuracy, but we quickly pivoted into building a very um, powerful search engine, a search portal on top of it. So what did we do? So we didn't start from the beginning. So all we had to do was a simple pivot, which is the phase two. So as you can see, all we had to do was build a web portal, which is deployed on S3 as a, a static website, which is powered by, uh, uh, Am uh, which is powered by Am Amazon Elasticsearch, right? So the search engine, uh, it's like Google-like search engine. So as uh, Carl and uh, Mark mentioned, so today if you go onto the MR portal, if you want to search about some information, you exactly need to know uh, a specific details about that. But this search portal is a full text search engine. You don't need to really know specific details about uh, MSRB data points. And then you can search across anything and come, uh, grab all the data and provide you based on the accuracy and the relevancy of the text that you're searching. So very relevant to, uh, very close to Google-like searches. Now, the data extraction metrics. We are very happy to uh, share these results, um, although some of them you'll see uh, they are not very uh, <clears throat> accurate, I mean, uh, not very uh, good to share. So the reason why we are sharing this is because this is a prototype, right? So the first prototype that we did we were able to achieve a very high success ratio on extracting PDF content, uh, just by leveraging uh, Apache Tiga and then those services. On the data uh, accuracy uh, extraction, there were opportunities, and with the way we classified that is, you have difficult uh, uh, data points, which were mostly in the tabular data, because each one was a different <coughs> format, so you had to do a lot of pre-processing, you had to figure out really what that means, so there was no uh, templatized version of it. Then there were like very, very uh, uh, easy ones which you could see on the very first page, which was the issuer name. So you could just go grab that. NLP does a great job at identifying those and uh, also identifying the uh, description. So we had a very high accuracy. Then you have these medium uh, accuracy ones, which was like embedded in that uh, text where there was a small date, uh, there, there was a date mentioned saying, this bond is going to be matured on so-and-so date. So how do you extract that? So that is like you have to build around, uh, so NLP does another good job of extracting that content, but uh, the date, but do you, you don't know whether that's the date you really want it or not. So now we have to build upon like what is the proximity analysis of that uh, data element uh, to really figure out does it follow and how, uh, how close do we have these elements on that. So easy, we were able to do 100% accuracy, medium, very high uh, accuracy as well. But uh, when you look at the difficult, we were uh, not able to um, extract uh, uh, much uh, with higher, higher accuracy. And this is where I was telling. We could have done, uh, uh, improvised this, build upon like what we already did. There are a lot of options for us to, and we already had a plan to do that. But since uh, to meet the business uh, goals, we had to quickly pivot and build a search uh, portal. Now, how did we build for the future? So the current state, so whatever, this is the current state. So what we are doing today, as I uh, mentioned, so you have all these issuer, you have a graph that we built, so there are like different elements across the, all the 350 pages that we are extracting, which you'll see the principal amount, the maturity date, and uh, offering type and all. So today, this information, MSRB can uh, get that on their uh, MR portal, but they can also get it from the search portal. The only difference is on MR portal, you really need to know what is that security information to go and find that out. But on the search portal, you just need to know uh, Washington DC Convention Center and it will grab you all the relevant results. So you don't need to really know the uh, QCIP number. So this is what they have today. Now, when we start augmenting this data, with third-party data, what can MSRB really search? So they can start searching about who is the legal entity identifier. This is not present in the official statement documents that MSRB gets today, right? So these are all additional data, which is third-party, which they can get it from uh, market uh, data and uh, from our different sources and start augmenting this. And it gives you a very, very powerful search capability backed by um, 
Amazon, Neptune, um, Comprehend, and Elasticsearch. Now, the key benefits of this solution, as um, I talked about the two prototypes. So when we first started, we the first prototype we uh, processed only like two months of data, which was like about 11 gigabits uh, of gigabytes. And then it was about like 10,000 files. So we said, okay, let's not do more. Uh, and let's try to see how much accuracy we can get from this. Now, when we pivoted to the search portal, we said, can we process more data? So we didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to change the architecture. And then we could easily scale because it was a serverless architecture leveraging Amazon, uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda, and uh, step functions and uh, very highly uh, uh, scalable applications. So we moved from 11 GB to 88 GB in this six to eight, uh, six week uh, uh, prototype to another six week prototype. And then which also resulted in a 10 to 90K, 10K to 90K documents. Now, as uh, Carl mentioned, one of the roadblocks was compute and storage, so which did not allow MSRB to process, uh, uh, build this kind of a solution on the data center. So if they had to build, it's not that they don't have the resources, they are all occupied, but if they had to build, obviously it would have taken a lot of time, and which is what we now cut it, sh cut it short to from months to weeks. And then the overall cost of this solution, which you have seen in the previous uh, slide, is less than $1,000 a month for each environment. Because it's all serverless, so you're, and uh, the cost for even that thousand is across for services like Elasticsearch, uh, because you're ingesting so much data, but still a confined cluster, a smaller cluster, and then you have Amazon Neptune and so on and uh, other services. Then we also made sure because uh, this um, it's a federal or quasi-federal entity, mm -hmm. so we made sure that uh, data at rest and transit both are uh, encrypted and using Amazon Key management, uh, management Service. In addition to that, the search portal that we are talking about is also secured uh, by providing authentication using Cognito. So users authenticate against Cognito, and then we also leverage the IAM for provisioning the access control behind the scenes. And then the last one, serverless and managed services, so as you can see why it is 99% serverless is because of Amazon Neptune, uh, which has to be hosted on a server, but everything else uh, in that architecture is serverless and uh, uh, managed services. With that, I'll hand over to Mark. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Santosh. So we have, just a f oh, we have just a few minutes left, and so we'll talk about what did we learn, the MSRB, from, from this prototype, and what are we gonna do with it next? So there, there are many lessons learned for us as an organization going through this, but let me highlight two of them. The first is the ability to rapid prototyping and, the, and failing fast. Um, that's not something that the MSRB typically does. We don't really prototype. And when we fail, it's usually painfully slow and expensive. So rapid prototyping and failing fast is something that was new to us and that we were able to do in, in this engagement. Um, as, as Santosh walked through, originally this was set out as a 12-week engagement, and what we really wanted to prove out was could we take our unstructured data, could we extract information from that, and could we validate it? Was it reliable? And um, our secret hope was that the answer would be yes, and we'd be maybe able to move this prototype into production, but that one segment of data that had accuracy uh, around 20% from the extraction was our failure. Uh, we hit that right at about the six week point where we had, we had designed and built the uh, architecture of the analytics platform that Santosh walked through. We were able to ingest the data, run it through, and we got those preliminary results. And at that point, we uh, rehuddled with Hitachi and said, what would it take to get that 20% to 50, to 70, to 80, to 90, to production quality level accuracy? And the answer was millions of dollars in years and years. <laughs> so we decided to pivot because <laughs> we don't have a millions and millions of dollars in years and years and years to get it right. What we did find though through prototyping was 
this remarkable ability when you break down those PDFs and are able to extract that you can actually search through that using kind of natural language free text. You can do a Google search, which coincidentally is not possible today. There's no production system by any third party data vendor or any regulator or any, anybody else that would allow you to do that, which is kind of remarkable. Um, and yet here we were, we kind of stumbled upon it in this prototype and we pivoted and said, let's build that out and build a search portal where you can just type in instead of having to rifle shoot to find the information you need, you either need to know the QCIP or a security identifier, a nine digit code or the precise name of the issuer. You could just say, geez, was there some convention center in DC and bam, you'd get this official statement. Not possible. It's actually not possible today. If you go to Emma, can't do that. Um, so we built that out. Without, that was kind of from our failure and from rapid prototyping, we kind of uncovered that value and pivoted, built out that. We demonstrated that to our board, and they were as pleased and as stunned as we were. Um, the second uh, lesson that we learned is you don't have to reinvent the wheel to do what we did. And um, we uh, partnered with Hitachi, uh, an, an AWS premier partner that knows a thing or two, as you guys saw about the cloud. Um, and we partnered with AWS uh, that also knows a thing or two about the cloud. Um, and we leveraged their expertise and their managed services and we did it in six weeks. Um, something that would, I don't even know how long that would take us because we don't do that. We're not able to do that. So it didn't uh, uh, cost us that much or take us that long. Um, we didn't need to reinvent the wheel and you guys don't need to reinvent the wheel. And so those are two probably big lessons learned for us. I'll wrap up real quickly with next steps. Um, this prototype was an essential demonstration project for our board. It went into our business case that we presented to the board as to why we should or should not go to the cloud. It was an exercise for us to explore the art of the possible. What could we do with data that we can't do today? We thought it was gonna be crack unstructured data and have 100% accuracy. Instead, it turned out to be, we're gonna be able to do natural language free text search that no one has ever been able to do before. And just showing that to the board and opening their eyes to the art of what was possible in the cloud was a very important part of the board's decision to go all in with AWS. A year from now, we will be knee deep and migrating at scale to AWS. And two years from today, we will decommission all three of our data centers and we'll be running production in the cloud. So with that, let me close on behalf of Henna and Carl and Santosh. Thank you so much for letting us share our story with you. You have our contact information. We'd be more than happy to, uh, uh, to talk with you more about what we did. And we hope that what we did will be useful for you as you think about um, the data challenges that you have in your organizations. So maybe I'll, should I, should I uh, Do we have time for, turn it uh, over? Yeah, so, so I will say, uh, oops. Uh, Please complete your surveys. Um, I don't, do we have a, a, a minute or two for questions? So if anybody has any questions, um, yeah. Just a couple of questions. One, you kept uh, referring to cost. Roughly how much does a whole prototype cost? Um, the second one is you had referred to some of the new tools, oh, sorry. You had referred to some of the new tools that AWS has created, such as Textract. If you were to look at that product architecture and use some of the newer tools that AWS has released today, how would that architecture change? So, um, the architecture wouldn't change because we left, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So the architecture wouldn't change because what we were using is the step functions. So step functions, you can pretty much invoke 
either any of the AWS services. So we would just replace one of the Lambda, which we're using to do um, uh, Pika extraction, right? So we'll replace that Lambda and then leverage um, uh, I would, text yeah. I, w I would say one potential, um, on. oh, I am on, okay, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, w I will say one potential simplification, I guess, is the fact that you had to, I think, use multiple tools to do, like, the, the table extraction. Yep. And, and so that's something that you maybe would be able to do just in Textract, right, is actually get those forms and, and tabular data out. Yeah, instead of doing, like, four lambdas, we just confined to one lambda. You, you had a question about the cost. I think that's a great question. How much did it cost us? It took us 12 weeks. Uh, total all-in cost was approximately $250,000, and um, that functionality is something that we hope we will be able to move into production at some point. Thank you. So uh, it looks like your, um, uh, when you do the ingestion, you have the PDFs, which have the uh, raw data, and you have also some ground truth about it in the XML. So do you ever like try to train your models instead of using the off-the-shelf uh, products you have into like extracting this information? Yeah, so as I said, like opportunities on getting that accuracy from 20 to 100. So we had like multiple thoughts that we uh, thought about. One was to build a repetitive machine learning model and also grab that feedback from the users on the curated data, not on the raw data. So you extract that text, you go take that uh, extracted text and then you start building. Because the refinement of that is, uh, relies heavily on feedback that you receive from the user. So as users are validating the data extracted and then they're reviewing, they could say, hey, you grabbed the date, but it's not the right date because now it's a different template and then they're using a different uh, phrase to say this uh, bond or issue is going to close at so and so. So we don't have that in our dictionary or our lexicon. So when we take that feedback, now it goes back into the training model so now when you get a template like that, now it's going to accurately grab. So that was one of our thought process to build that machine learning model when we put this into production. D did that answer your question? Maybe one more. Unfortunately, that concludes okay. our time for this session. Yeah. If you have any